Alrighty. My Apple, seeing you. How are we doing this afternoon? Not too bad. Let's open up with a word of prayer and we will get into the book of Psalms. Salam aliwaki no para sniapon, Father. We just thank you as always for a time to get into your word, Lord. Time to be able to hear from you. Lord, as we desire, Lord, just to be ministered to through your word. Because your word is truth. Lord, your word is life. Lord, in our heart is to learn more about you. Father, we have a closer relationship with you. Lord, as we just get into your word. So, Lord, we pray you speak to our hearts tonight, Lord. You minister to us as we, Lord, get into these Psalms of David. Lord, these Psalms where he poured out his heart to you. Lord, we pray that through that, you now speak to us. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Well, you recall something like Nigel, as you've been going through the book of Psalms, last time we gathered together, we were in Psalm chapters 26, 27, and 28. A Psalm chapter 26 was a test. David that he was not a good person. And so he asked the Lord to test him, to show him what was inside of his heart. As a result, because he wanted to be tested by the Lord, judged by the Lord, that is Kalibutan, he was able to stand before the Lord and enjoy the presence of the Lord. We should never be afraid to ask the Lord to examine our hearts. Psalm 27, Pabrito Sakon, was the one thing. For there was one thing that David desired, one thing that he would seek after, and that was to dwell in the house of the Lord. Because he wanted one thing, he was able to receive a personal, intimate fellowship relationship with God Almighty. But, Mechakasadja, no sooner did he have this desire for being in the presence of the Lord, than he questioned if even the Lord heard him, if the Lord would answer him. For David, much like us, is not necessarily stable. How do we feel on this particular day? David showed that same instability, wanting to be in the presence of the Lord, yet feeling sometimes like God did not hear him. Which is why we have Psalm 28. A cry for help. As David cried out to the Lord to be his rock. And the Lord answered his prayer. And the Lord blessed him and was his shepherd. So Psalm 26, 27, 28 is a test. His desire and his cry for help from the Lord. Which brings us to Psalm chapter 29. Now Psalm 29 is a psalm regarding the voice of the Lord. How does God sound? How does God speak to us? Notice verse 1, we have an introduction rather standard, rather typical. We read it as a psalm of David. So, sino nung salatni? Who was the author of this particular psalm? Hari David naman. This is another one of those 75 psalms that David wrote. So again, we're going to be in these for the better part of the first, you know, 70 chapters that we're going through. So this is a psalm of David. It is a personal psalm. Notice, it does not mention to the chief musician. It wasn't a worship song for everybody. It was a personal psalm to the Lord. And the first thing that David requests is that we give to the Lord. For notice, we have given to us in four different ways. That we are to give to the Lord in verses 1 and 2. First and foremost, we're to give to the Lord's, O oh, you mighty ones. And now stop right there, Anai. For the word mighty one literally means the sons of God. In the Hebrew, it's Bene Elohim. You who are the sons of God, you who are God's children, you are to give to the Lord. And now the idea here is simple. We, because we belong to the Lord, should be giving everything to the Lord. What should we be giving to Him? Well, notice, we give to the Lord glory and strength. This glory and strength speaks of our talents, our abilities, the things that God has provided for us. Maybe we're good at a particular thing. Maybe we're good at music. Maybe we're good at 
you know, drawing, we're very good artists, or we're good with math, or we're good with languages. Whatever we're good at, it is a gift from the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, all that we have comes from Him. Therefore, we should be giving glory, we should be giving our abilities, our talents, back to the Lord. We give Him our strength, we give Him glory for all He has given to us. Pero mais up again. Notice in verse 2 there again, we give the Lord the glory due His name. Pamakot na lang. Kung ang ginohatag tanan tanan sa aton, wala halin sa aton, at halin sa iya na lang, should we take credit for the things that we do? Should we take the glory? Should we take the honor and say, oh, ito, oh, ito, oh, gid. Sagad gid ko. I'm very talented. Thank you very much for recognizing my great ability. We don't take the glory because it's not from us. In everything, we are to give the glory to Jesus. We use our talents for Him. We give the glory to Him because it all comes from Him. Therefore, notice there at the end of verse 2, we are to worship the Lord in beauty and in holiness. Now, interestingly, Ang pilit ni para sa aton. The word choose, the word to worship there, carries the idea of making the decision. Ang pilit sa aton. We choose to worship the Lord in beauty and in holiness because we recognize it all comes from Him. Kahit tanan-tanan halan sa iya, even the air we breathe. Kung may hangin sa aton, if there's air in our lungs, kung bugtaw kita sa kigina sa aga, if we woke up in the morning, that all goes back to the Lord and His grace, His goodness. So we choose to worship Him in everything because all things come from Him. So David opens up, give everything to the Lord, since it all comes from the Lord. But that brings us to a second thing we notice in our chapter. The second thing we notice about that is the voice that God has. What is the voice of the Lord? And we notice several things about it. First and foremost, notice in verses 3 through 4, Ang tingog sang ginoo, turo turo gid. The voice of the Lord is not quiet. It is very, very loud. And we see how loud it is in three ways. David describes the volume of the voice of God using three different descriptions. Number one in verse three, it is loud like water. For notice we read, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. Mastudo kumpara sa mga tubig. The God of glory thunders. He is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. Kuso kuso gid. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. So the idea here is, what does God's voice sound like? How does His voice come across? Well, quite frankly, it is extremely loud. How loud is it? It's louder than many waters. And now to give an example of what this would be like, I have had the opportunity in the past to visit a place called Niagara Falls. You may have heard of it. It's actually in the United States. It's one of the largest waterfalls in the world. An example of how much it is, how much water it is, there's three million liters of water that fall over Niagara Falls every second. Count one second, three million liters just fell over. Ang deson na second, the next second, three million more liters fall over. Every second of every day, all day long, all year long, three million liters go over this waterfall. The result is, turo turo git. If you were within kilometers, just a couple of kilometers of the falls, you'll hear it. It sounds like a deep rumbling and a roar. It's very loud. It's overwhelming. When you get close, you can't even talk to the person next to you. You're screaming. 
because it's just so loud from the waterfalls. This is the voice of God. He is not quiet. He is powerful when he speaks. Now that may bring up a question. You might answer, I've never heard that. <laughs> I've never heard a booming, overwhelming. Pastor wrote in my upon. I've never heard a booming, overwhelming, you know, blast of the voice of God. Well, that's because God doesn't always speak through audible means. Not that he cannot. Do not misunderstand. Absolutely, God can and does, if he so chooses, speak audibly. Although I'm reminded of Elijah. If you remember Elijah fled from the presence of Jezebel? And he went out to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai in the wilderness. And there on the side of the mountain, he heard the still, small voice. The whisper of the Lord. And you're going, well, wait a minute, what is it? Is it a whisper or is it a do 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 get very loud? When God speaks, it is powerful. Meaning that the power of his words transforms, changes, challenges us. With a particular tone that he speaks, well, that's up to the Lord. It might be a whisper. If he wants to, he can boom with a voice of thunder and of many waters. But he speaks not just audibly, he speaks through his creation. He speaks through the world around us, Psalm chapter 19. Boasts in, and proclaims to us the fact that he cares for us. And he speaks, most importantly, through his word. God is never silent. The word of the Lord is powerful. His voice is booming above the many waters. The question just simply becomes, Pamatikita? Do we listen to him? Are we paying attention to when he speaks? But there's a second way we see his powerful voice. And that's in verses 5 through 9. His voice is powerful like the raging waters. His voice is powerful like the mighty storm. For notice, verse 5 tells us, The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. Now, hula lang anay. Kay pasindi na kanjindi ka mo, Kung may cedar of Lebanon, dako, gid nga kahoy na. The cedars of Lebanon were famous for being huge trees. They would be two and a half meters thick. Can you imagine a tree? They would be from me to about halfway across the room. That's the thickness. It would stand a hundred meters tall. These are the cedars of Lebanon. They're not small trees. They're mighty, huge trees. Unbreakable, unbendable, hard wood. Yet, the voice of the Lord shatters them splinters them, breaks them into many pieces. It is stronger than the strongest wood. But notice he goes on in verse 6. He makes the calves skip, the Lebanon and Hermon like a young ox. Now, he's talking about Duakabukid. He makes two mountains leap. In particular, the mountain of Lebanon and the mountain of Hermon. Hermon being the biggest mountain in Israel, so about 3,000 meters high. So the voice of the Lord can make mountains jump like a calf. Kuso kuso gid, the mountains leap in the presence in the voice of the Lord. He splinters the trees. The mountains jump. Notice verse 7, the voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And his temple, everyone says, glory. So what is being described here by David is a thunderstorm. The voice of the Lord is like a thunderstorm. And the picture of the fire leaping is lightning coming down from heaven. And just as lightning comes down, very loud, the thunder shakes the mountains, makes them leap, burns down the forests, wipes out whole pastures, makes young deers give birth because 
And they go into labor because of the lightning storm and the thunder. That is the description of the voice of the Lord. He has ultimate power and authority. Which is meant to comfort you and I. Basi ang pinsar kita. Basi ang anong budlay sa itong kabuhi. Mano problema lang. Whatever it might be. Maybe our difficulty is greater than what the Lord can handle. Maybe our problem is bigger than God. But when you look at who God is, just what His voice can do, His voice that is greater than the many waters, His voice that can shatter the Lebanon trees, make the mountains jump, burn down the forests with the lightning and the fire and the power of what He can do, why would we ever worry about anything that comes to us? God is greater than whatever problem we would face so long as we put our trust and faith in Him. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, if we have the faith of a mustard seed, we can say to this mountain, bukid, lumpak ka sa baybay. Be cast into the sea and it will obey us for nothing is impossible when we put our faith in the right place. And this is what David is getting to. Trust in the voice of the Lord. Listen to the voice of the Lord. There is power in the word of the Lord. And if we're looking to and listening to the Lord, nothing will be impossible for us. But he does give us a third description in verses 10 through 11. For the voice of the Lord is not just mighty like the waters, not just powerful like the lightning coming down from the sky, but it is a kingly voice. Notice verse 10. The Lord sat enthroned, so my throne no sha, at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. And now stop right there, Anai. When it says the Lord sits enthroned upon the flood, this word flood is very specific. It's only used in regards to the flood of Noah. It's not talking about just my, you know, Baha, Iskandian. This is the flood of Noah. It's a very special Hebrew word used only in Genesis with the exception being in this one place in the book of Psalms, nowhere else in the Old Testament. So the Lord, the King, sat enthroned upon the judgment of the world. How powerful is the voice of the Lord? How mighty is our God? He can judge the world with a word. God says it, the floods come and the world is destroyed. That is the power that comes from the voice and the word of our God. But notice there in verse 11, the Lord gives strength to his people and the Lord will bless his people with peace. Don't miss the contrast. If we're, if we're not obeying, if we're not listening to the voice of the Lord, He can bring judgment, destruction. He can wipe us out, bring calamity into our lives. Pero, if we're giving ourselves to Him, giving glory to Him, recognizing all we have is from Him and wanting to follow after Him, then He gives us strength. He gives us overwhelming peace. So the idea, the choice that we simply have is what do we do with the voice of God, the word of the Lord, with the power that it offers? Do we stand judged by it or were we empowered through it so that nothing is impossible for us? Questions on Psalm chapter 29, the voice of the Lord. Psalm 30 is the need for humility. David, writing again, notice in verse 1, it is a psalm of David when he dedicated the house of David to the Lord. Now, this is an interesting background in history. So David has just become king over Israel. He's just conquered Jerusalem. 
He's become very wealthy, very powerful, and God has given him victory over all of his enemies. According to 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 2, David knew that the Lord had made him a powerful, powerful king. There had never been a greater king in Israel. There never would be a greater king to rule over Israel, other than Jesus Christ, than David. But with his success... With all the blessings, the mighty palace, Iabalai was a palace, it's not a small little house, Dako Dako Giri the blessings God gave him, there was danger. And the danger was to begin to become prideful because of all of the success that God had brought. Let me address this real quick. Kon, my problem is out of if we're stepping out to serve the Lord and nothing seems to work. If we're stepping out to do ministry and not many people are attending. There's a Bible study, not many people are showing. There's a prayer meeting and very few people seem excited. That can be challenging to our faith, to be perseverant. Wala untat. Keep going, believing that we need to be faithful to what God has said. But it is equally as dangerous when everything goes right. If everything is going good, if there is blessings and everybody seems to be encouraged and built up in their faith and God is doing a mighty work, be very careful. For in our success, there is the danger of thinking somehow it is about us and not what Jesus has done through us. This was David. He was in a dangerous spot because he was having great success. He was dedicating his palace and all of the wonders and splendor of what God was doing to the Lord. Notice verse 1 we pick up. He was talking first and foremost about his victory. He said, I will praise you or extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. So sa so again. He's worshiping the Lord, praising the God intensely because he goes, my enemies have been absolutely wiped out in front of me. No one has had any victory over me. Now, this was quite true. For this particular period, David was conquering every enemy Israel ever had. In particular, in this season, according to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17, David even was able to conquer the Philistines. They were, well, who was the most famous Philistine? We'll ask you that. Goliath was a Philistine. Yeah, that's probably the most famous of them all. He was certainly the biggest one that we read about in the Bible. Das, das, kid, just over three meters tall. Big guy. Can you imagine me? And then another meter on top of me. That's Goliath. He wouldn't fit in this room. He wouldn't even get in here. Get the duck down. Big boy. Philistines, constant challenge, constant problem for Israel. Yet, David was able to defeat them. But the way he defeated them was interesting. He asked the Lord. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 5. The Philistines were challenging David, and David said, Lord... Should I go out against them? Ang sabat sa gino sa iya? Oo, magira ka na. And so David went out at the word of the Lord and he defeated the Philistines. Pero da son tuig, nagbalik sila. They came back and David asked God again, Lord, should I go out and fight the Philistines? Ang sabat sa gino o sa iya? Hindi na lang. Do not go to war. Instead, I want you, palipo na lang, go around them. And come at them from the forest. Attack them from the trees when you hear the wind blowing over the top. So David obeyed what God said. He defeated them again and they never were a challenge. It destroyed the strength of the Philistines for the rest of the reign of David. Pero, I want you to look at how David fought the war. He asked God, Do I go? Yes, okay. Do I go? No. Do it a different way. Because in our Christian walk, there's a danger of when something works, 
when something brings victory, when something is a blessing, we want to do it again. So I'm like, again, this worked. So let's do it, what? The same thing, exactly, don't change a thing. It worked last time, so let's do the same thing again. But it's not what God desires. Don't just repeat things. Don't do things over and over out of ritual. That is called religion. It brings death. We seek Jesus. Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to serve? When do you want me to serve? As we are dependent on the Lord, listening to the Lord, not following a formula, that's when we're going to find there is power in the work that we do. David did have victory in the Lord. But not just victory. Notice verses 2 through 3. He also was healed by the Lord. Notice verse 2. O Lord my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. So, wala pa sigurado ano na tabot de. Pero alay machog si David. Apparently, he was really, really sick. So sick that he thought he was going to die. But as sick as he was, we're told that he sought the Lord and God caused him to come out of his sickness. He was saved from his illness, whatever it was, so that God pulled him up out of the pit. Because God can heal. I do like this. Can God heal us if we are sick? Can God make us well? Yes. Does God always heal? No. It's an important distinction. Again, don't go back to a rite or a ritual. There are times when God does not heal. Why? Because he's got a different plan. We'll go back to Paul. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Lord, take this away from me. Pull this thorn out of my flesh. No. For my grace is made perfect. My strength in your weakness. So God does sometimes let people be sick, but God is more than able to heal. In fact, Exodus chapter 15 verse 26. One of the names of God, Yahweh Rafa, God is our healer. So absolutely the Lord is able to heal. He is the great physician. He is the one who can cure and take away any sickness if we just simply go to him and believe that he can touch us. David had been healed by the Lord. So he'd given him victory. He'd given him health. But number three, notice verses four through five. The Lord had given him favor. For David says, sing praise to the Lord in verse 4. You saints of his, give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is only for a moment, but his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So David cries out and says, listen, having understood the victory and the healing that come from the Lord, we should sing praise to the Lord. We who are His saints. We who are faithful. We who have put our faith in the Lord. We should remember Him and worship Him. Because, pamati, basi may budlay, pero delete na lang. We're told that the sorrow only endures for a night. But the joy comes in the morning. He may be angry with us, but it's for a brief amount of time. His joy is for a lifetime. In other words, what God wants to give, what He wants to do, is far greater than any challenge we are ever going to face. Does that mean we will not face challenges? No, we will for certain face challenges. John 16, 33, in this life, we will have tribulation. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, the Lord punishes every son whom he receives, but it's short, it's brief, 
it doesn't last. And the reward, the joy, the glory that comes afterwards is far more wonderful than anything that trial can ever bring. Therefore, we are to praise, we are to cry out and remember the goodness of the Lord. David had experienced that favor. He understood that God was gracious. So victory, healing, and favor had all been poured out upon King David. But this is where the problem came in. For notice the second thing. David needed a change of heart. In verses 6 through 12, we're told that David was in a very unsafe place. For he said in verse 6, In my prosperity, I said, I will never be moved. Did he gather get any? So David is saying, listen, because everything was going well, what a problem. I had victory. I had healing. I had the favor of the Lord. Everything was going great. As a result, Bugal Sakon. Pride welled up in my heart. I thought I was something special. And I said, I'll never be moved. I am going to be king forever. Nothing's ever going to touch me. No harm, no difficulty will ever be able to approach me. He and his pride began to forget it was about the Lord. But notice, verse 7 goes on to say, But Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. So David gets arrogant. David gets proud. David begins to think he's something. Think that he's immovable and forget it was the Lord that made him successful. As a result, God hid his face. When we are proud, we will find God resists us. God resists the proud, but he pours out his grace upon the humble. David was proud and arrogant, so God was resisting him. This is the period in history, by the way, where David, though he was doing well, began to add mga asawa. Hindi silang, hindi dua, hindi talawa pa lima, damo na. He began to add many wives. According to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 13, David had many wives. Wives. Problema. God had specifically told the kings not to have many wives. According to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17, if David were to go back to the word, listen to the word, give himself over to obeying God's word, he would have remembered that that was something he never should have done. David was successful. David was healed. He was victorious. But he got arrogant. And Satan found a way to come in and make him compromised. This is the danger. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Be careful when you think you stand, lest you fall. If we're confident, Oh, what a problem. Kuso, kuso, gidko, tindako. Man, nothing's going to move me. I love Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. I am rock solid because I'm so in love with the Lord. Be cautious. There's an awful lot of eyes in that statement. And if we're looking to ourselves, if we forget that it's all about clinging to Jesus Christ, we are set up for a fall. Satan will come in and look for a crack in the armor. An opportunity to get in and to stumble us in any way that he can. With David, it was his wives. His wives were a compromise. His wives were not keeping him obedient to the word. And ultimately, it was his desire for wives that would lead him into sin. Ano takit ng salat ni David? What was his biggest sin? She had a name. Bathsheba. It was his pursuit of women that almost destroyed him because he could not see his pride. Be so very cautious. And again, it's different for every person. Maybe it is 
lust that can be a danger. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's money. Whatever it might be, if we're not careful, Satan will find the crack and he'll take us down. This was the danger that David had. Because he became arrogant, God hid his face from him. But there was an answer. Notice verse 8. David says, having seen God hide his face, he cried out to the Lord. To the Lord he made his supplication. So literally, because of the consequence of his pride, God hiding his face, David began to cry back out to the Lord for grace. Pamate. The word here, supplication, is literally the word grace. He cried out to God for grace. It's the Hebrew word Hanan. It means, Lord, give me your favor. Lord, I've gone wrong. Lord, I see where I have made my mistake. Lord, I need you to come back and open up my heart again in humility. And the moment we cry out to the Lord, James chapter 4, verse 6, He gives us grace. When we understand we can't do it on our own. When we understand we have our need for the Lord. We need that help of the Lord. He gives us His power, His Holy Spirit, to give us victory in life. So although David was lifted up in pride, through pride, God humbled David so we could receive His grace once again. Which is why we finish up in verses 10 through 12, where David said, I turn my mourning into dancing. For he says, what profit is there in my blood? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, have mercy upon me, my helper. David is asking the question. Is there any profit for what he's going through? You know, would he praise him if he went down into the pit? Instead, he goes, Lord, no, beg, I beg of you, please give me your grace. For you have turned my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and you have clothed me with gladness. To the end, that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So don't miss the transformation. In his success, David became prideful and arrogant, which separated him from the Lord. But because he was separated from the Lord, he cried out for grace and God restored him and took his mourning and made it gladness. Took his sorrow and made it joy because David went back to God. If you ever get to that place where because we become prideful, because we become arrogant, because we think we somehow can do it. And we watch God hide His face from us. The answer is no harder than simply crying back out to the Lord. The moment we reach out to Him, the moment we cry out to Him, God will heal, restore, and give us His grace. Take our mourning and turn it into joy. David recognized and realized the need for humility before the Lord. Psalm chapter 30. The need for humility. Psalm chapter 31. We'll finish up with this this evening. Psalm 31 is David asking for help in times of trouble. Now we have the introduction that we've seen many times before to the chief musician, a psalm of David. Now remember, basta sa chief musician, my canta ni para sabilox Israel. This was a psalm meant to be sung throughout all of Israel as a way to teach them something about the Lord. It was how they learned the Word of God. Nobody had a Bible in those days. Bibles were expensive. Bibles were hard to come by. So they used the songs to teach them about God. So this was to the chief musician to teach them about the Word of God. Now, this psalm in particular is quoted a lot in both the Old and the New Testament. Psalm chapter 31 is one of the most quoted psalms in the Bible. For instance, David himself quotes from Psalm 31 and Psalm 71. So it's a psalm quoting a psalm. 
So David directly quotes from the first three verses of this psalm when he does Psalm 71. Jonah quotes from Psalm chapter 31, verse 6, and Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. When he's in the belly of the whale, Jonah quotes from Psalm chapter 31. Jeremiah quotes from Psalm 31, 13. My enemies are balibotzakon, enemies all around me. He quotes that some six times in the book of Jeremiah. Psalm chapter 31, verse 24 is quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. And most importantly, Psalm 31, 5 is quoted by Jesus Christ when he's on the cross. The last words of the cross come from Psalm chapter 31, verse 5. Unto you I commit my spirit, O Lord. So a very frequently quoted psalm in both the Old and New Testament. But the opening statement that David makes is the need for the trust in the Lord. Notice verse 1 through 5. We need to trust the Lord. We read in verse 1, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me not be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. So this word trust is the Old Testament equivalent of the New Testament word faith. Lord, in you I put my faith. Because I put my faith in you, you are going to deliver me in your righteousness. Stop right there. By faith, we access the righteousness of the Lord. Now, this is a powerful truth. This is the New Testament truth. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We have all sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23. We'll be separated from the Lord. The only hope we have is to put our faith, our trust in the Lord, so that we can receive His righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us that Christ who knew no sin became sin for us that we might receive His righteousness. By faith, David picking up on this, we receive the righteousness of God. So, first and foremost, we trust the Lord for His righteousness. But notice verse 2. We also trust the Lord because He is our fortress. We read in verse 2, Bow down your ear. Deliver me quickly. Be my rock of refuge. A fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock in my fortress. Therefore, for your namesake, lead me and guide me. So David is begging, Lord, don't just give me your righteousness. Bow down your ear. Pamati Salcon. Pamati, listen to me and be my rock. Quickly be my salvation. Deliver me. Be my fortress to keep me safe from all of my hardships. Who is our rock? Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus himself would say in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, if you listen to my words, pero, you also do them. We need to listen and do what Jesus says. We will be like a man who puts his house upon the rock. Immovable, unshakable, unable to be moved no matter what trial or tribulation comes into our life. This is what David is recognizing. Lord, I need you to be my salvation, but I also need you to be my rock, my foundation on a daily basis. Lord, I put my trust in you because you are who saves me eternally and in every moment of every day. For, notice verse 4, God, you are my salvation. For he writes and says, Pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me, for you are my strength. Now stop for a minute. Because this is prophetic. This looks forward to the cross of Jesus Christ. As we're going to see in a moment, Jesus quotes from this. Jesus had a net laid in front of him. There was those who were secretly plotting against him. You recall how Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and plotted how they might betray and ultimately crucify Jesus Christ, they were plotting secretly to destroy Him. 
To which, notice verse 5, the response is, Into your hands do I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God, of truth. Here's the quote. Jesus, knowing that there was a plot against him, said, Into your hands do I commit my spirit. Quoted in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Question. Why did Jesus quote this particular verse as his last words upon the cross? Certainly not accidental. Jesus didn't do anything accidentally. So why quote it? I have to think to bring us back to the psalm. His last words were, Into your hand do I commit my spirit. Untalang. He stopped quoting. But you would know if you were familiar with the Psalms. Wait a minute, that's from Psalm chapter 31. Let's go back and continue reading. What does it say after into your hands do I commit my spirit? It says, you have redeemed. O Lord God of truth. Because why did Jesus die? Why did he go to the cross? Because he is our Redeemer. Through the cross, He paid the price for our sin. Through faith in Him, we receive the grace, the righteousness of God. He becomes our rock that we can stand upon. Jesus quoted this to point us back to this verse so we would see that He is the one who redeemed us from all sin. He is the object of our faith. Unto you do I commit my spirit. But that brings us to a second thing that David gives to us. Having stated the importance of trusting in the Lord, he talks about the danger of being separated from the Lord. Notice verses 6 through 13. For, number one, he said he was hated. For I have not hated those who regard useless idols, but I trust in the Lord. So see David, he was opposed to anyone who put their trust in useless idols, false deities, things that were not true gods, because he put his trust in the Lord. Now this is interesting. Because this verse, verse 6, is quoted by Jonah. Now let's go back to the story of Jonah, because this is good to get context. If you recall, Jonah had been commanded by God to go to the Ninevites. The Ninevites who were a wicked godless, idol-worshipping people. Ang sabat ni Jonah, si Ginoo, when asked about whether or not to go to the Ninevites, he said, hindi pa di I won't go. And he ran the other direction. Nineveh was east. Jonah went west to Tarshish. Got on a boat, started sailing. What happened? Well, so una may bagyo. Big storm come up. And then Jonah recognized the storm was because of him. And he said, throw me over and the storm will stop. Sure enough, the sailors threw Jonah into the water and the calm winds returned. And a big fish came and swallowed up Jonah. And he was in the belly of the fish for three days. And after three days, he prayed. No, no, stop for a minute. Can you imagine being so stubborn so resistant to the purpose and the call and the command of God, so not wanting to do what God said, you waited three days in the belly of a fish before you finally prayed. That was Jonah. After three days in the belly of a whale, he finally went, okay, Lord, I give up. And he cried out to the Lord and he said, God, quoting from this verse, I have hated those who regard useless idols. In other words, Lord, I hated the Ninevites. I didn't want to reach these godless people. I didn't want to go and warn them about your judgment. But he said that from the belly of a fish because he was resisting what God wanted. God, Pamati, does not want us to hate anyone. Do we hate a godless world outside our doors? Do we come against them? Are we opposed to them? Are we angry with them? No. We're called to love them. Jesus died for them. The whole point is to go and share the gospel with them. Romans chapter 10 verse 14 tells us how can they hear, how can they believe unless someone preaches to them. We go bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ. David 
hated those who were idol worshipers. He should not have. Nor should Jonah. Because God died for them like God died for us. But there's a second thing we notice regarding this separation from the Lord. One is hating those who hate the Lord. But there's also adversity that comes into our life. Notice verse 7. David says, I'll be glad and rejoice in your mercy for you have considered my trouble. You have known my soul in adversities and have not shut me up in the hand of my enemy. You have set my feet upon wide places. So David is saying, listen, Lord, I know that life can be challenging. I have adversity, but I'm very happy. It's very strong in the Hebrew. Like, because Lord, you have looked at my humility. You have looked at my brokenness. You've seen the trials and the troubles in my soul. And you have caused me to have victory over those who are opposed to me. You have set my feet upon a safe, wide path. Masi may pamangkok ko mo. Kung may problema, kapalo ang ginoo. Does the Lord know when we're going through difficulties? Does He see when we're facing hardships? Does He see our tears? Does He see our hurts? Does He see our brokenness? Does He see our troubles? The answer to every one of those questions is yes. Proverbs 15.3 The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Nothing is missed by Him. He sees, He knows, and when there is humility, He responds. And he sets our feet upon a safe, a wide road. David had adversity, but God saw it. And because David knew the Lord saw it, it caused him great joy. But there was sin in his heart. Notice verses 9 through 10. David did have a problem. For he said, have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye wastes away with grief. Yes, my soul and my body. My life is spent with grief, my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity. And my bones are wasting away. So David here begs the Lord for grace. And again, the word here is grace. When it says have mercy, that word mercy is the word hanan. There's that word grace again. It's the Hebrew Old Testament version of grace. Lord, have grace. Why? Because I'm in trouble. What's my trouble? I have sin in my heart. And the sin is crushing me. It is breaking me. My eyes are spent. He's just weeping because of his sin. He says, my body is spent. My bones are breaking. I am literally falling apart because of the sin that is in me. Do you know that sin is not just spiritually destructive, but it's also physically destructive. Sin will call us stress, worry, anxiety, fear, and it can also cause physical diseases. I mean, it's amazing how much damage sin does to our body. Quite literally, we will fall apart physically, not to mention spiritually. When we have sin that is not confessed before the Lord. David had sin and it was causing him literally to fall apart. Psalm chapter 32 verse 3. We'll get here to Sonsimana. He said, when I did not repent, referring to the sin with Bathsheba, he said, my bones grew old and I groaned all day long. Literally his sin was destroying him because he was not confessing it to God. David had iniquity in his heart. But ultimately, that caused him to be forgotten. Notice verse 11. He said, because of my sin, as a result of my iniquity, I am a reproach among my enemies, especially my neighbors. I'm repulsive to my friends. Those who see me from the outside, they run away. I'm forgotten like a dead man, out of mind. I'm a broken vessel. For I hear the slander of many. Fear is on every side. That's quoted by Jeremiah many times. They take counsel together against me. They scheme to take away my life. 
So because of David's sin, it wasn't just personally he was falling apart. Everyone was opposed to him. His enemies were against him. His friends were avoiding him. His neighbors wanted nothing to do with him. All because of the sin that was inside of him. He was a broken man who people just wanted to go away. All is a result of sin. Basta may salat sa atong kabuhi. Grabe ang pinahangalan sa ginoo. God will not just take away our physical health. He will take away friends, acquaintances, family. He'll strip everything from us in an attempt to try to get our attention and break us. To bring us to a point of humility. David had sin in his heart and it was causing his whole life to fall apart. Which brought him to the third thing we noticed, which is a contrast. David saw the contrast between repentance and hardness. And notice verse 14. He saw that salvation ultimately came by coming back to the Lord. He says, but as for me, para sa akin, I will trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies, from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy." sake. So David, though he had sinned, put his trust back in the Lord. Because he trusted the Lord, therefore God caused him to be delivered, shined his light upon him, and caused him to have grace in his life once again. Now, was David a perfect man? Wala sa lahat siya Perfecto siya? No. Interestingly enough, who was better, David or Saul? Who was more righteous? David or Saul? Voila. <laughs> but not, not who was righteous, because you're right, neither one was, but who was a better person? If you were to compare David and Saul, who was better? Saul. Saul, actually, if you were to put them side by side, you would say, from a human perspective, Saul was a better man. What sins did Saul commit? He wasn't obedient to the Lord. God said, wipe out all of the Amalekites. Saul did not. And therefore, God rejected him. And Saul became a grumpy man. He was kind of, you know, boring out. He was not too happy. But he wasn't evil, per se. He wasn't a wicked man. He didn't, you know, kill babies or, you know, have affairs or murder people. If you were to compare, Saul was a better person than David. Yet who is a man after God's own heart? David. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would the greater sinner be the one who is actually the more righteous? Not because of anything he did. Please listen, because this is one of the most powerful truths in the whole New Testament. We are not a good person because of what we do. Don't think, this is how I live my life, because I read my Bible. Don't you know, basa ako Bible, like three or four chapters kada aga, in pilaka oras ko, mabasa ko Bible, and mga moyo, oh, you know, when they offer those times for prayer, I don't take one. Slot, I take two. It's not three hours, it's six hours for me. I go all night long and I never fall asleep. I am so righteous. I am such a good person. God must love me because of how good I am. Don't ever think that. We are not good because of who we are. We are good because of the grace of God. It is by His grace we become a man, a woman after God's own heart. It is a work of Jesus Christ. David recognized though there was sin in his life, there was salvation, redemption by putting our faith in the grace and the goodness that God offers to us. He became, because of that, a man after God's own heart. But there's a contrast. Notice verse 17. He says, but do not let me be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. 
Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak insolent things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. So David pleads, Pesentagino, please don't let me be ashamed. It's a cohortative. He's pleading with the Lord. Don't let me be ashamed, but let the wicked, those who do not trust in you, let them go down to the grave in silence. Let them who are arrogant, those who are proud, those who come against your righteousness, those are the ones you cast out. Who ultimately becomes ashamed? Anyone who does not come to the Lord. And there's the contrast. The righteous aren't those who do what's right. The righteous are those who recognize they're wrong and call out for grace and mercy. Those who think they are right, those who think they are good, are the wicked because they do not ever realize their need for Jesus Christ. And in their pride and in their arrogance, they go down in silence into the pit. This is what David recognized. This is the truth that he brought out, which is so powerful. It's all about the goodness and the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Which brings us to the fourth and final thing we notice, which is his love for the Lord. Having found forgiveness and redemption, David responds with love. For notice, first and foremost, he sees the reward in verse 19. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in the presence of the sons of men. You hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secret in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. So when we put our faith in the Lord, even before other men. My when we are bold about our faith in the Lord, when we proclaim the fear of the Lord more than the fear of men, that is when the Lord shows us His great goodness. When He hides us in His secret place from those around us that would want to harm us. We find the goodness of the Lord when we are bold towards the Lord. Can you be a secret Christian? Can we follow Jesus on a Sunday, but when we go home in the afternoon, act like everybody else and just blend into the crowd? Is that allowed? Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 12, if you are ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before the Father. If we are not bold for the name of Christ, bold for our faith in Christ, if we do not profess the fear of the Lord before the fear of men, then there is no help or salvation that comes from the Lord. David recognizes the reward comes to those who proclaim their fear and trust in God. But not just a reward, notice that God hears in verse 21. He goes on to say, Blessed be the Lord. For he has shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I was cut off before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplication when I cried out to you. So David thought that God had abandoned him. Basi, hindi, you know, dalit na lang yes about sa giyong. Alam sa giyong, oh, hindi na nag a quick answer from the Lord. And he thought, man, that's it. God no longer is listening to me. He says, but I was too quick. Too quick to make the assumption that you were not listening. Too quick to assume that my sin had completely removed me from you because God, you heard. When I cried out to you, you answered in your time. God does not always answer us when we want him to. We can cry out to the Lord and well, it's about and think, did God really hear? Does God not care? Is God not concerned? God doesn't always answer when we want him to. But believe me, much like David, he always will hear a prayer of repentance. God will never turn his back on humility. 
And as often as we come to him, as soon as we come to him, he does hear us. And God in his time will answer us. Show us his marvelous kindness. Again, that word is his good grace. His favor poured out upon us. God responded to David in his time when David cried out to the Lord. Which brings us to the last thing in verse 23, which is the love he had for that of the Lord. He goes, oh, love the Lord, all of you saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful. He fully repays the proud person. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart, all of you who hope in the Lord. So sa katapusan, ang sabak kay David sa aton is palangga sa ginoo. Anyone who has received the grace of the Lord, the word faithful means those who have received grace. Those who have received His favor. If we receive the grace of the Lord, love the Lord. Because know that God will repay the proud. That's a warning. Ang mga bugal, may bayad sigurado halang sa gino para sa ila. Hindi maayo, they'll be separated from the Lord. Therefore, don't be proud. Come in humility and love the Lord that He might strengthen those that wait upon Him. David, because he'd been forgiven, responded with a love for God. Psalm chapter 31. Is the need for help in time of trouble? Questions. 